Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be going over the capitalization table or cap table, which is essential for startups and venture capital investments in this lesson. So for all the files and resources here, you'll want to go to this URL, bringingintowallstreet.com slash KB slash venture capital slash capitalization table. I'll link to this in the comments and pin it as the first comment. You can get everything there. This is another excerpt or sample from our venture capital and growth equity course. Now, cap tables are central to all startups and VC-backed companies, but they're poorly explained in most sources. So I want to give you a bit of a crash course tutorial here and cover the main points with some simple examples. This is not a step-by-step -step tutorial. We're just going to be focusing on the highlights and some of the key calculations here because we don't really have time to spend a few hours going through a full cap table in this lesson. So as usual, I'm going to start with a short version of cap tables, then we'll go through ownership and investment sizes, we'll look at options and liquidation preferences, then we'll look at new shares and the options created in each round, we'll look at the share price calculation in each round, and then go through some exit calculations and explain the significance of cap tables there. Let's start with the short version. A capitalization table or cap table lists the shares owned by each person or entity, the percent ownership they have, the value of those shares, and any special terms and conditions associated with those shares. So for example, you could have the co-founders, the employees of the firm, the venture capital firm shares, you list all their ownerships, their share values, and their liquidation preferences, which are one of these many special terms and conditions. So here's a very simple example in Excel. We have management, the co-founders, executives, we have employees, we have all their options that they have, and then we have the investors down here. And we actually track how many shares each one gets over the many funding rounds of the company. We have the diluted ownership, the exercise price for the options here. And then down at the bottom, we have what these shares are actually worth. And then we have some special terms here, such as the liquidation preferences where they exist, and then something called participating preferred as well. Now, the reason this matters is because for a startup, if two investors each own 100 shares, they may actually get different treatment in an exit. They may have different terms, different seniorities, other things like that. Also, you normally want to track changes in ownership and valuation over time. So with a normal company, these wouldn't be major issues because with a few exceptions, a share is a share and you don't really care how ownership has changed over five or 10 years. But for a startup, it is very important to track this. So that's a short version of cap tables. Let's now go into the calculations. We're going to demonstrate this with a simplified example here for an early stage startup that raises a seed round and then a series A round and then exits after that. So at the very minimum, you want to show the amount invested in each funding round, the pre and post money valuations, and any special terms attached to this funding. The post money valuation equals the pre money valuation plus the investment size in the round. And then the new investors ownership in the round equals the amount they invest divided by the post money valuation. These pre money and post money valuation numbers are really just equity value. So as with equity value for a public company, when it raises equity, when it issues equity new shares, its equity value goes up, but its enterprise value stays the same. So let's go into Excel and see how it works in this simple example. You can see the company founding here, they initially have 1.2 million shares. Now in the seed round, the VC firm invests 2 million at a 6 million pre-money valuation. And so that means that the post-money valuation is just the 2 million plus the 6 million. And then it means that their ownership here is the 2 million they invest divided by the 8 million post-money valuation. So that is the basic setup for a cap table like this new shares get created. And so they don't own 33% of the company. They only own 25% of the company because the company itself is now worth 8 million. To go a little bit beyond this, we're going to look at options and liquidation preferences, which are also very common in these funding rounds. So a liquidation preference, let's say a $2 million liquidation preference means that if the investors would earn less than $2 million in an exit, so a sale of the company, they can stay in preferred stock without converting to common shares, and they can get this $2 million liquidation preference instead, assuming, of course, that there's at least $2 million available to fund this. In a cap table in the early stages, this liquidation preference doesn't directly factor in. So if it's a 1x preference, we just take the 1x and multiply by the $2 million, and it doesn't do anything for right now, but it does come into play later on in the exit analysis, which is why the liquidation preferences are listed down there. We'll get into that in a little bit, but you do want to track this over time and have it set up initially in your table in each funding round. Options are granted to employees to incentivize them to get them to stay at the company for years because if they stay, they can get options with very low exercise prices that then become worth a whole lot more if the company grows and becomes successful and they can pay to exercise their options, get shares in the company and then sell them for a large profit. To calculate the number of shares, 
if the options are created before a funding round takes place, you take the shares that existed before the round, you divide by one minus the options pool percentage to gross up the total number of shares, and then you multiply by the options pool percentage. So let's go and look at an example of this. In this case, in the seed round, the options actually get created for the employees before the venture capital firm invests. So we can go and take the 1.2 million that existed before, and then we can divide by one minus the 10% option pool percentage, and then we can multiply by this percentage because we wanna get the 10% of this new greater share count. And this comes out to about 133,000 because now there are about 1.33 million shares in the company. So here's the calculation right here, just listing it in PowerPoint. Now I do wanna say up front that it is a little bit weird to do this. Normally you grant the options in the round at the same time. It's a little bit odd here because doing this before the round takes place means that after the VCs invest, the employees only end up with about 7.5%, not the 10% of the company that this options pool should have represented. In any case, those are the basics for options and liquidation preferences. Let's go to new shares and options in the round now and look at a slightly more complex example. So one key question is how many shares does each investor group get when they invest in a startup? And then how much do they pay for each share? This can come up later on because you may wanna track how the company's share price changes or what the exercise price on options are across the rounds, for example. It's a little bit more complicated than it sounds because some groups like the employees here get shares or options for free. And so the price in each round has to be adjusted for that. Let's look at an example here where the Series A investors invest $5 million at a $15 million pre-money valuation. And they also upsize the options pool from 7.5% to 20%. To set this up, the first step is that we have to sum up the ownership percentages for the groups whose share counts do not change in this round. So let's go into Excel and start some of the setup in the Series A investment right here. So the post-money valuation here will just equal the investment size plus the pre-money valuation. And then the post-money ownership for the Series A investors will be the 5 million divided by the 20 million, so they own 25%. The employee option pool size is 20%. The new investors get 25%. However, the thing to note here is that the co-founders and the seed investors, they are not getting new shares in this round. And so to calculate the post-investment share count, we can say one minus the Series A investor ownership and then the employee option pool size here. So we know that the co-founders and the seed investors will own 55% after this round takes place. And so to calculate the post-investment share count, we can take the 1.2 million and the 444,000 and divide by this 55% here. And now we get to about 3 million shares. And this happens because their shares do not change, but their ownership changes, which means that other parties, namely these new investors and the employees get additional shares or options in this round. So I have the calculations here and we already actually went through step two and got to the new share count like this. So we get 3 million total shares. And then step three is that we need to now allocate these new shares or options to the employees and the new VCs. For the new shares in the series A round, we take the 3 million up here that exists after the round and we subtract the number that existed before the round. So the 1.8 or 1.7 million here. And then for the options pool, we can take the 3 million of shares. We can multiply by the 20%. Remember though, that they're not actually getting 600,000 shares or something like that in this round. They're actually getting less than that because they already have about 133,000 common share equivalents. So we have to subtract that out. And then for the Series A investors, we can just take the total new shares and subtract this number, and we get to that. So about 747,000 new shares for the Series A investors. And so after we do all that work, we can see what the cap table looks like. In short, the co-founders went from owning about two thirds down to more like 40%. The employees went from 7.5% to 20%. The seed investors went from 25% to 15%, and the Series A investors own nothing, and now they own 25%. And everything here still adds up based on all of our calculations. Now, something else that sometimes comes up is the share price calculation in each round. And there are two ways to do this. You could take the investment size and divide by the shares purchased, or you could take the pre-money valuation and then divide by the pre-money shares plus the free shares and options granted in the round. So let's look at both these methods for the series A round here. We'll take the investment size, 5 million, and then we will divide by the shares that were purchased in this round. So I can sum up the new shares for the seed and series A investors, even though really just the series A investors are purchasing shares, 6.69 for the share price. Another way to do this is to take the pre-money valuation and then 
we can get the pre-money share count down here. And then we can just add to it the number of new shares or options that are given away for free to the employees or the co-founders. So the 464 right here. And we get to the same $6.69 share price. Now, if you have terms like anti-dilution provisions or safe notes, or you have a convertible note or venture debt or warrants, or you have pro rata or follow on investments, all these can complicate the calculation. But at a basic level, this is what you need to know for a simple cap table. The last point I want to cover here is the exit calculations. Now, the main point or one of the main points of a cap table is to determine the proceeds to each group in an exit, such as a sale or an IPO. But we're going to focus on the sale case here. So if you have a $100 million exit with this type of company, it's pretty straightforward. You take each group's ownership percentage and you multiply by 100 million. So let's go down and take a look at this. You can see here I've listed the ownership for the seed investors, for the Series A investors, and for the common shareholders, the founders and employees. And all we're doing is taking this $100 million exit and multiplying by the percent ownership in each case. So this is pretty simple and straightforward, but where it gets a little more complicated is if there are liquidation preferences, you have to check and see if it's better for the VC investors to take their liquidation preference or to convert to common shares. Now, clearly at a $100 million exit, it is better to convert to common and get a percent ownership in the company because 15 million is a lot more than 2 million and 25 million is a lot more than 5 million. However, this starts to change if you go below around the $20 million level. And specifically here, I wanna look at what happens when we go down to $18 million. So if we go in and we change the numbers here and I say 18 million instead, now we can see something interesting, which is that the series A investors get 5 million here. Their liquidation preference is 5 million. If they convert to common, they'd only get 4.5 million. So clearly it's better for them to stay with their liquidation preference to stay in preferred stock and get that instead. And in Excel, we can do this with a min max formula. We can just compare the exit value of converted to the liquidation preference. And then of course, make sure that we have enough proceeds to actually pay for this liquidation preference. That's what this min max formula is doing. The complication besides the min max formula is that if the series A investors do this and they stay in preferred, then that changes the ownership of the other groups. So specifically the seed investors don't just get 14.9% ownership. They actually get bumped up to more like 20% ownership because now the series A investors are out. And you can see this down here in the formula for the seed investor proceeds, we're actually recalculating the ownership. And so we're saying that if the investor proceeds to the series A investors are less than or equal to the liquidation preference, then that means they must have taken their liquidation preference and that therefore we need to recalculate the ownership here. We need to take the 14.9% and divide it by 14.9% plus 60% to get the new higher ownership for the seed investors and then multiply by their exit value if converted or if the liquidation preference is better for them, we take that instead using a similar min max function. And so you can see here how the series A investors take their liquidation preference, but the seed investors actually convert to common because the 2.7 million they get is still more than the 2 million liquidation preference that they actually have. Without a full cap table, these types of special terms and conditions and ownership changes would be lost. And that's why it's so important to do this for startups, especially when you're dealing with a startup that is likely to be sold as many VC backed ones are. So that's it for this tutorial. To do a recap and summary now, cap tables, the short version. At a minimum, you need the amount invested in each round, the pre and post money valuations, and the ownership and how that changes in each round. With ownership and investment sizes, post money valuation equals the pre money valuation plus the amount invested. Ownership equals the amount invested divided by the post money valuation. With options and liquidation preferences, options, the most standard thing to do is to base it on the new share count after the round takes place. Normally it's expressed as a percent of the total shares. Liquidation preferences, you just track them over time as a multiple of the capital that the VCs invest. With the new shares and options in each round, the idea is to take the groups that do not change and then take their share counts and divide by their ownership from before the round to gross up the total share count and get to the numbers like that. Then you can back into the shares and options granted to other parties. The share price in each round, it could be either the investment size divided by the shares purchased or you can take the pre-money valuation and then divide by the pre-money shares plus the free shares and options granted in the round. Exit calculations. For reasonable exit values, you can just take the percent ownership and multiply by the exit equity value. But if there are liquidation preferences involved, you have to set up checks like we did with the min, max, and if functions to see what each group is doing and then allocate the proceeds and recalculate the ownership accordingly. That's it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about cap tables and you have some simple Excel examples to work off of.